As we prepare to receive our offering, I want to share with you from Matthew 22. It's the story of the Pharisees coming to Jesus and challenging him. They're trying to trap him. They're trying to ask him a question on whether or not it's right to pay taxes uh, to Caesar or not. And Jesus asked them for a coin, and somebody gives, them, gives him a coin, and he, he looks at it, and I can just picture this in my mind's eye. He looks at it, and then he points to the inscription, and he says these words, whose image is this, and whose inscription? And they all looked back at him, and they said, Caesar's, of course. And then he said, listen to these words, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. As I've studied this exchange and thought about it through the years, and many of you have heard me talk about this if you've taken our 201 course, which I talk about the habit of giving, uh, I can just see Jesus and what he's saying. The money has Caesar's inscription on it, image of Caesar on it, but you have the image of the Most High God on you. When we give, we're reminded that we're giving to the one whose image we bear, the one who gave us everything we have in our hands, the one who gave us the ability and the thoughts and the opportunities to receive what we have. And we're also reminded that we want others to receive the hope that we have been so freely given by our Lord and Savior Jesus, so we give to the work of the local church. We would encourage you to join us in teaching people that the image of the Most High God is on them, that their highest calling is to worship Him and worship Him alone. And when you give to this ministry, that's what you're joining us in doing. So if you want to mail that gift in or drop it off here at the church any day, Monday through Thursday, or if you want to go to our mobile app and, and give through the app, or if you want to go on the website and find a way to uh, give at cccnow.com, we would love for you to join us in our mission to make the name of Jesus famous because of what he does to change lives. As we prepare to hear God's word, let's pray so that our hearts and minds are ready to receive what the Lord wants to give us today. Holy Spirit, speak. Thank you for all that you've given us. And now, as we prepare to receive even more from you, May we honor you and glorify you in everything we do and say. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. I bet you've been thinking, at least at some point in the last six months, as everything has changed around us, it's getting harder and harder, not only to just live my life and figure out the right way to to get things and do things, but also to express our faith and live out our faith. There's a lot of good reasons for that. I mean, as we've been reflecting, everything's changed around us. So you know that you're not alone because the whole world right now is being rattled. The virus is affecting everybody. The economic uh, realities are affecting everybody. And then we have regional things going on and national things going on that don't necessarily affect other areas of the world, but there's other places experiencing difficulties, like we mentioned last week, and we continue to pray for what's going on in Lebanon. So it might feel like, wow, th there's never been a more difficult time to live our faith. Well, let me, let me frame something for you to, to gain perspective, to, to remind ourselves of the fact that others have lived through difficult times and not only survived, but they have thrived. In fact, Larry Osborne in his book, Thriving in Babylon, says this, it's never been easy to live a godly life. The pressures and challenges we face today may be daunting, but they are nothing new. I hear it was rather tough in the first century. It's still incredibly dangerous in Iran, Saudi Arabia, China, and many other places. What he's saying is something we need to hear. It's always been tough to live a godly life, 
And it's tough, especially in other places in the world right now, to live a godly life. So what are we to do? That's what we're going to approach today as we continue in our series on being strangers in a strange land. This land, this world, this earth we find ourselves, if we believe in Christ, we become strangers to it. The reason is because our citizenship is in heaven, and that is where we belong. So we now identify with the values and, and the ideals of heaven over and against the ideals and the values of the earth. So the struggle is always going to be, well, the way we framed it last week. Do we withdraw from society and form our own little Christian cloister or club? Well, that's not what Jesus did. Do we violently oppose and try to overthrow uh, the powers that be. Well, that's not what Jesus did. Do we accommodate and become like them and blend in? Well, that's not what Jesus did. Or do we engage? That's exactly what Jesus did. And that's where he invites us to meet him today. You see, Jesus is out there in our network of relationships right now. He's with our extended family, he's with our friends. He's with our coworkers. He's with our neighbors. He's with the strangers we meet on the street. And he wants us to meet him as we engage them. You see, when we join Jesus, we're fulfilling our calling to take the good news and the hope that we've received to everyone that we meet. So what we want to do is we want to go back today to look at this idea of engaging learning to thrive in our modern-day digital Babylon and not just blend in and accommodate or withdraw or violently oppose and try to overthrow. Instead, we want to engage and thrive. So we're going to look at Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael again. You might know those last three names better as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we're going to look at what helped them thrive, not just survive, but thrive in the land in which they were thrust. Remember, they were thrust and carried as slaves into Babylon. Their whole world was upended. All their routines that they learned as children and, and what they were expecting in their dreams into adulthood, they were all just ripped away. But what were they given instead? A new opportunity to meet God in a new way, and they did. It's obvious that they chose it because we read about their stories in the Scripture. You know, you have a lot of freedom to choose how you're going to respond to this time of upheaval. You have a lot of freedom just like everybody else. And I keep reminding myself of what Jesus taught us. Remember, he says, as he prayed in John 17, you're going to be in the world. So you're going to be facing the pressures that everybody else faces, believer, non-believer. You're in the world. But remember, I'm not taking you out of the world because, my words now, Jesus is praying and he wants us to engage the world. But here's that last and most important bit. Remember, above all else, and he prays it for us, you are not of the world. You are a child of God. You are a citizen of heaven. You are a new creation. You're not the brokenness and the definitions of the earth. You are a follower of Jesus. And where he is now, one day, because of your faith, you will be with him. So don't use and abuse the freedoms you have. Let me give an example, and, and this fits with what we're looking at in the book of Daniel. When you think about the freedoms, let me give you five categories that we all have. We can use our money any way we want to. We can cho choose to use substances and chemicals that the government and the law says are permissible. We can use our time any way we want. We can use our language any way we want, which includes written language on social media platforms. And we can use our purity any way we want, according to the laws of the land. If we are of the earth, we might say, if it's legal and it feels good, do it. But as Daniel Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael said, and as Jesus teaches, and as all the early Christians model, 
Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because it's legal doesn't make it okay for you. If we understand that we are not of the earth, we might ask about each one of those areas, is it beneficial to me? Will it build me up in my faith? Will it help me live a healthy life? Is this the way God invites me to cope with the difficulties I'm facing? When we think about those things, we learn to understand how to move through each of the freedoms that we have. So I don't use my money any old way. I don't go spend it on uh, fruitless things. Instead, I think about how I can be a steward of what God has entrusted to me. Do I attack debt and pay down debt and try to stay out of debt in my life because that's what God wants for me. That's what we teach in our Financial Peace University course, for example. Or do I just run up my credit cards? I think that's what a person of the earth would do versus someone of heaven. What about chemicals and substance abuse? Just because I can go and use different chemicals doesn't mean it's good for me. And a lot of times I'm just running away from pain and difficulty when I do those things. What about my time? How do I use my time? Do I serve so that others come to know the Lord? Or do I use it on my own selfish pleasures and pursuits? Listen, there's a time for recreation, as it says in the book of Ecclesiastes, but there's also a time to serve. And what about my language? Just because everybody else talks that way, should I too? These are all things that we need to think about, and especially how we use our bodies. I mean, the, the culture of the world doesn't care how you use your body, but God does, because you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. So let's go back to Daniel Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. I'm going to read the scripture back again, a few of the passages in chapter 1, and we're going to pay attention to the things that help them thrive in their Babylon so that we can thrive today in our digital Babylon. Here's the scripture. First passage is Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. The Word of God says, Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. All right, I want to point you immediately back to verse 3 of what we just read. Notice what it says, Ashpenaz was the chief of court officials. In most of your English translations, they've politely translated the construction that we have in the ancient Hebrew. What Ashpenaz actually was, was the chief of the eunuch. Some of you might have a translation that still renders it that way. That is the accurate way. And how does one become a eunuch? Well, you're a eunuch when you become, as a male, castrated, which eliminates your ability to have sexual function and obviously to have a family. So Ashpenaz and all the court officials who were in the Babylonian court, in Nebuchadnezzar's court, they were made to be eunuchs. And that would include our four boys, Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Think about it from their point of view for just a minute. It's not something that I've spent a lot of time on in the past, but I've been thinking about it as we've been going through their, this series. They faced an incredible trauma at a young age. Many scholars believe that they were dragged from their homeland in Israel, the capital probably Jerusalem, and dragged through the desert ripped away from their family, and deposited in this foreign capital, Babylon. Now, that would have been traumatic enough. Then they were submitted to being eunuchs. You can imagine the difficulty, especially in the Hebrew mind. One Bible scholar was pointing out that this would have been especially traumatic for a Hebrew male because the Scripture actually says that those who have been made to be eunuchs are cursed but also the ability to have future and a family. So Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael all went through that. You could probably appreciate the fact that that's a pretty significant thing to deal with. 
Now, we don't know a lot about how they actually reacted to this specific event, but we do know from the arc of their life, as we read it in the entire book of Daniel, that they overcame it. They didn't let this thing define them. Instead, they chose to identify themselves as children of God, not what was done to them. They didn't let it drag them, this difficulty of the external trauma of everybody being ripped away from their homeland and the very personal trauma of being made to be eunuchs. They didn't let those things define them and cause depression and anxiety. Instead, they found some kind of strength somewhere else. That's what we want to focus on. Now, in order to more appreciate what we're dealing with, you need to understand what Ashpenaz's job was. Ashpenaz the chief of the court officials, was to instruct. He was to take these children through higher learning, university instruction, or advanced degrees. And they were to learn the culture and the language and, and the ideas of the Babylonians to become court officials. One of the books I've been reading from Kinnaman and Matlock points out how important it is that as people are subjected into a place they didn't want to go, in their case, Babylon. In our case, this new cultural emer emergence that we're all facing, I'm calling it digital Babylon, that we need people to remain faithful like these four did. You see, these four model something for us. They show us that others have gone through difficulty and they have survived. Listen to what Kinnaman, Kinnaman and Matlock say. Exiles who remain faithful to their true home are important during times when society undergoes fundamental change, especially when the broader social stresses to conform reach a fever pitch. They play a critical role in reminding us how to stay on the path of faithfulness. So we find encouragement by reading the story of these four boys, but also I want you to know this, based on what Kinnaman and Matlock are saying. Others will find encouragement when you choose faithfulness to the timeless truth of being a child of God versus settling for the ideas and the culture of the earth. You see, when we remain faithful in the face of difficulty, it inspires others in the same way that we are inspired here. So we get ourselves encouraged and we get the chance to encourage others. As modern readers, we fail to realize this immersion that these four boys were subjected to. Like I was saying already, to remain faithful in the midst of being trained in the culture and the language of all that the Babylonians were about, we little understand how demonic and difficult and crazy that system of learning would have been. It would have been antithetical to the Hebrew mind of Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. And yet they were immersed in it. Not only that, they were immersed in it and they became the best of all the court officials. We're going to read about that in a minute. But notice what Larry Osborne says about how bad the situation actually was. In Thriving in Babylon, he says, the state-sponsored religion of the Babylonians was satanic. And the core curriculum in the schools of higher learning included a large dose of astrology and the occult. Daniel and his three friends were forced to complete a rigorous three-year study program. I guarantee you, on the worst day, in the worst class, with the worst teachers, my kids were never exposed to anything as godless and flat-out demonic as the standard curriculum in Daniel's classroom. Now, I lifted that quote and wanted to share it with you, especially for those of you who have kids and grandkids that you're praying for and thinking about. You need to know that these four boys were subjected to anything, uh, any, uh, what, something that's far worse than anything that we ourselves have faced. And they came out on the other end thriving and following God. Like I've been saying, we're going we're gonna to explore why that is. But I want you to remember, simply engaging the material doesn't mean we accommodate to it. And that's the hope that we have. We can engage, especially with our children as parents and grandparents, and point them to the timeless truths and hope and pray towards what we see in Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. And I want to encourage you, others have run that race. We can too. All right, let me conclude the reading in Daniel chapter 1 today, reminding you 
of what Dave talked about a couple weeks ago, that, that Daniel and his three friends chose not to eat the royal food. Instead, they chose to eat the vegetables and follow a, a more kosher diet. I'm going to pick it up in verse 15. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his kingdom. So get this. They looked healthier. They were wiser and more agile with the material. They were Renaissance men. In other words, they were culturally agile. And that's what we're talking about today. How can I be culturally agile to a point? But no, not only that, they were better versed and more well studied than everybody else. And I love what the scripture says. Nebuchadnezzar found them 10 times better than everyone else. Now, why is that? Now, I'm going to suggest to you that Daniel... Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah had their priorities straight. We know this from reading the scripture, that there's two things at least that they did that set them apart. Daniel and his friends were definitely centered on the Shema and the Ten Commandments. They had core values. The core values that trumped everything else they learned and the core values through which they viewed everything else in life. It's kind of like reading. I read everything through my glasses. In the same way, Daniel and his three friends viewed all that they were learning through the lens of the Shema and the Ten Commandments. Now, I know a lot of you don't know uh, what the Shema is. It's shorthand for the ancient Hebrew pronouncement found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Look at Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. That's the Shema. It's this teaching of core identity that comes from core values. The Lord is one. The Lord is in heaven. The Lord is the maker and creator. There is no other God. So as they learned all these other things, it was subjected to that core belief. But also, they knew the Ten Commandments. We know they knew the law. And so they had, this, they had this ethic of how they behaved. They worshiped the Lord. They kept the Sabbath day holy. They didn't practice the idolatry of the Babylonians. Sure, they studied it, but they didn't fall into it. In the same way that somebody today who's a Christian might study another religion, we study it to understand. We don't study it to practice. That's what Daniel and his three friends did. Now, they not only had core values, the Shema and the Ten Commandments, but they also had core practices. Now, I could put them in the context of our core practices, worship, prayer, the Word of God, meaning studying the Word, fellowship and service, even evangelism. And how do I know? Well, imagine their situation. It's at least instructive to ours. When they got dragged from their homeland into a foreign land and they were forbidden to practice their language, how many of you believe they had to be creative if they were going to continue to worship and if they were going to continue to pray and if they were going to continue to read and study the word? In fact, one of the great ways that the language and the the preservation of scripture happened through the ages when written, when the written word was taken away and destroyed, people had committed it to memory. Already by a young age, these four boys would have had a certain amount of scripture committed to memory. So they studied the word, they practiced the word, they clearly met in fellowship together. You can read in chapter one, for example, and chapter two, uh, I'm sorry, chapter two, when Daniel gets pressed to understand the dream, what's he do? He calls a prayer meeting with his three friends. They clearly met regularly for fellowship and encouragement. They didn't stop meeting. 
just because of the circumstances that were around them. Instead, they found new creative ways. And as Ryan talked about a few weeks ago, they refused to bow down and worship what they were not supposed to worship. We see that in Daniel chapter 3 with the three boys refusing to bow down and worship the golden statue. Now, there's a lot more we could say on that. But if that's how they thrived in Babylon, we should ask the question, how can we thrive and survive in our digital Babylon? Well, like those three boys, you might be feeling like you're being dragged, kicking and screaming into this new day. Maybe the shutdown has caused you to just be frustrated and shake your fist at heaven. Maybe uh, the economics or other difficulties that we're facing or engaging people online. Maybe all these things are frustrating to you, as well they should be. So how can we be creative? How can we engage our day? learning from these four boys about how they engaged their day. You see, here's the thing. Digital Babylon has different values. It has different core values than the core values we're taught from Scripture. Let me give you a perfect example. I mentioned that Daniel and the other three would have known the Shema, and the Shema would have reminded them about their core identity, their core identity that comes from heaven. Well, digital Babylon our world today has a core value that's being propagated and it's antithetical to that one. Going back to Kinnaman and Matlock in Faith for Exiles, they say the new moral code of digital Babylon says that the individual is the center of the moral universe, but Christianity teaches that we orient ourselves by external sources of authority. In other words, how do I find identity according to digital Babylon? I look inside myself. How do I find identity according to Christianity? Same as these boys, same as the Shema. I find my identity outside myself according to an authority outside of myself who tells me who I am. So here's the thing. As we look at the most important questions we're facing, the same important questions that everybody faces all of the time throughout time, as we ask questions like, who am I? What is my significance? How should I live? How should I form and conduct my relationships? And what's the meaning and the purpose of all this? As we ask these kind of questions, where are we going to look? Are we going to look for those answers on the internet? Or in the new coolest book of philosophy? Or are we going to look to the timeless truth of Scripture that helped others survive in their day and will definitely help us survive in our day. And I want to suggest to you, we need to do the same thing. So if I'm going to thrive in digital Babylon, here's the first thing I want to point out. I renew my mind by fixing it on the core values of the faith. I renew my mind by fixing it on the core values of the faith. Now, if You've been going through this series with you. That should immediately ring a bell for you of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And if, if you haven't heard one of the previous messages, make sure you go look it up. Even pause right now and read Romans chapter 2, 12, verses 1 and 2. And what you're going to see there is that we are called to offer ourselves as living sacrifices and to renew our minds. How do we renew our minds? We renew our minds by keeping it fixed on the core values of the faith that we find that are fixed in the word of God. Remember, Jesus is the word who stepped out of heaven. When we read this, we are reading the living Christ, the living God. And this is what renews our mind when I study the scripture and when I study the principles that the scripture points to. Core values, for example, like the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty the maker and creator of heaven and earth. I believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and all that goes with it. I could also talk about things like the five solas, which are called the five alones of the faith. I believe that I am saved by faith alone, in grace alone, uh, according to Christ's love alone, according to the word alone, to the glory of God alone. These are things that shape how I view the rest of the world. When I fix my mind on the core values of the faith, I read everything I'm exposed to through that. I mentioned identity through this series and also in this message. So when I view my identity, 
What is the most important thing? You'll hear me say this all the time. I am a child of God. Why? Because that's the most important thing the scripture tells me. So the first thing about thriving in digital Babylon is no secret. It is fixing my mind on the core values of the faith. And the second one is not a secret either. I offer myself as a living sacrifice by engaging the core practices of the faith. I offer myself as a living sacrifice. People always ask when they read Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, what is a living sacrifice? Well, it's a sacrifice, literally. If you read Old Testament, you'll know more about what I'm talking about. But the sacrifice was put on the altar and held down by the priest as it was offered. A living sacrifice climbs up onto the altar willingly and stays there. So we willingly follow God's way and we stay on that path not deviating from the most important practices that shape us and mold us. We've already mentioned them because these practices were, were the ones practiced by the boys. But let me put it on the screen for you. The core practices of the faith are worship, evangelism, discipleship, ministry, and fellowship. These are the ancient practices that go back to the ancient people of the Old Testament as well as the new believers these are the things that people have done through the ages that have helped them grow as they fixed on the values of heaven that are, according to the word, the core values of the faith. These practices help reinforce the core values. When we worship, we worship according to the word. That's why it's important to worship weekly. When we worship, we are shaping our mind and our heart according to the teaching of the word. We approach the word, we hear from the word, we respond to the word. When we do evangelism, we do what I was talking about earlier in the message. We engage others and we meet Jesus and we share his love. This is what Jesus came to do. When we do discipleship, we're getting into the word. We're training others as well as training ourselves. And fellowship connecting with others. How many of you know you need to be encouraged just by simply being in the presence of encouraging people? These things don't change. And of course, ministry, finding creative ways to serve others. These ancient practices are the ones that shape us and mold us. We cannot give up on them. As a church, we need to continue to be creative in finding new ways to express them but also as each individual member of the body, we need to be recommitted and creative as well in how we're connecting. So if you're bound at home, what does it look like to try and be creative in fellowship and worship, for example? How can you serve? You might not be able to serve in the way you want to, but there are other avenues of reaching out and connecting. That's one of the amazing opportunities Digital Babylon does present to us, ways to reach out and connect that were never available to other generations. So be creative, be on purpose, and know that you can't deviate from these core values or these core practices. If you want to thrive today the same way that Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael thrived in the past, you need to follow the path that they walked. And also, like we've read earlier, what those great cloud of witnesses that Hebrews 11 talks about. The, Hebrews hall, the Hall of Fame in, in the book of Hebrews. I close with this. Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael were culturally agile, but they did not accommodate. We're going to talk more about that as we go through this series. Jesus was the same way. He met and engaged sinners and tax collectors, but he did not become like them. He invited them to become like him. And the Apostle Paul shares throughout the scripture that, for example, in 1 Corinthians 9, that he became all things so that by all means he might win them to Christ. Not compromise, but meet people and engage people. As I close, I want to encourage you. Learn to be culturally agile, agile but only to a point. Stay committed to the main things. Stay committed to the main practices. Stay committed to the path that Christ has put you on. And as I close in prayer, I want to invite you before you prepare to take communion, if you are especially with others, but even if you're by yourself, use those 
discussion questions. Review them. Think about them. Pray about them. And remember, as I pray for you now, as we talked earlier, the in, not of, not out of prayer from John 17, but also the other part where Jesus prays that we would be one with the Father. How do we thrive? By remaining one with the Father. And how do we remain one with the Father? By staying fixed on His Word, His Son, Jesus Christ. By staying fixed on what Jesus teaches, His core values. And by staying fixed on the practices of Jesus Himself. Those five ancient practices we mentioned, and there are more, they were all things modeled by Jesus, and you can read about them when you read about Him in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let me pray for you. Father, we are definitely in this world. And Father, you have told us that we're going to stay in this world. You're not plucking us out of it. So Lord, help us. You've also told us that we are not of this world because we belong to you. We belong in heaven. So Father, come. Ground us in these core values. Fix our minds on the Shema on the truth that the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the one that we are to view all of life through. Come Holy Spirit, teach us what it means to engage and not, incom- not accommodate. And Lord Jesus, we want to meet you. We want to grow. We want to thrive. We don't want to shrivel. We don't want to shrink back. But we want to thrive in our day. And even more, have encouragement for the downtrodden and the brokenhearted As we opened this service, we thought about the young people who are going through anxiety and depression, but there's probably plenty of other people that are coming to all of our minds. Oh God, let us be an encouragement to them. Let our hearts be encouraged. And most of all, as we draw close to you, Lord, let the things of earth fade away and let the beautiful, amazing love of Jesus shine more brightly, in whose name we pray, amen. We don't usually think about food as, or eating food as an act of faith. But in Daniel's case, his refusing to eat was a huge act of faith. He didn't want to identify himself with the gods of Babylon. That eating would have been an act of worship to those gods. He would have loved to be here at this table. We call this the Lord's table because it represents the body and blood of Jesus Christ. The bread stands for his body that hung on a cross for you and your sin. The cup represents his spilled blood poured out for you. We, in taking part in this, identify ourselves with our Savior, Jesus Christ, and our faith in what he did on the cross for us. You know, you can't live without eating food. Just like that, you can't live eternally without believing in this food and what it stands for. So we're going to invite you just to hit pause, gather something appropriate for your bread and cup, and then take a quiet moment just before the Lord. Thank Him for His great salvation. Confess your sin to Him and relish in the fact that your Savior loves you so much and gave His life. Now let me pray. Father God, in the night in which Jesus was betrayed, He took bread, He took a cup, He passed it among His disciples, And he said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood spilled for you. As often as you eat and drink it, do it in remembrance of me. So today, Father, we identify with our Savior Jesus, and we do this to remember him. We do it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.